Good blessed midweek to you, dear friends. Good blessed midday to you. Good blessed time that we can separate like the parting waters of the Red Sea, like the swirling waters that were in front of Peter from last week's reading. <clears throat> we spread them apart so that kind of like on the dry land, we can take a moment to take a look at this powerful and beautiful Psalm, Psalm 32. We pause and we allow this space to create a descent within us to the bottom of the soul, to the bedrock place where God right now is breathing his Holy Spirit into you, <clears throat> giving you the wherewithal to reflect for these 15 minutes upon what God's word is filtering from this psalm of thousands of years ago to your present moment and mine. So we stop as we have always done. We pause and we allow the grace of the present moment to sink in, being aware of the body, relaxing, <clears throat> finding in this moment a moment of peace, of clarity, of reflection, of wisdom, of love. Feel your heart beating. A nice deep breath, exhaling. Reminds me of our pet dogs when they climb up onto our bed to take a rest. When they settle down, they take one last sigh as they sink into the bed. Let's you and I sink into this present moment and take some moments of silence. Lord God, we offer you this time. We thank you for offering this time to us in the blending of your gift to us and our gift to you. In that oneness, we pray your wisdom and insight as we pray this psalm. Amen. <clears throat> Share with you this fire starter that I wrote for the version for families with children. I remember as a boy setting up a little space just for myself. It was in our cellar. I took a few sheets and fastened them to the ceiling, creating a small private place to be alone. Something in us wants to feel enclosed, protected, undistracted by the wider spaces around us. Psalm 32 verse seven has this kind of feeling as the sacred writer joyfully announces you are my secret hideout. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of rescue. As we close our eyes, imagine that you are entering into the very heart of God. Feel yourself surrounded by God. Rest in God with joyful faith. I think of that wonderful song, You Are My Hiding Place. He filled my heart with songs of deliverance. And so as we take this psalm and we pray it, let's join with countless numbers of people all through the ages, including St. Paul. We'll hear verses 1 and 2 of this psalm repeated in Romans 4, 6 to 8. Paul quoted from it. Augustine took the words of this psalm and inscribed them on his bed so that it was the first thing he saw in awakening. And so we pray this psalm together. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, 
Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, O you upright in heart. When I was a boy, raised in a Catholic family, I was not very comfortable with sin, mainly because I thought I was sinning when times when I wasn't, particularly with matters of human sexuality. So it really was uncomfortable to me. I didn't know what to confess. Sometimes I overconfessed. And so it was for me, if you will, how guilt got in the way of really confessing maybe the deeper selfishness or whatever else or the fears that were going on within me, who knows what, years have gone past. And we used to be, have a, we had a family practice of going to confession every two weeks on a Saturday afternoon. And I had to tell you, I always preferred the alternate Saturday. So we'd have to Scoop, scrape together, scoop together, I think that's what a scruple. We would scrape together some uh, sins that, oh, I was disobeyed my mommy or I lied or this and that. I have a little laundry list to give to the priest and we'd make our confession, receive our penance. But it was very much a ritualistic thing. It didn't have the tonality that Psalm 32 has, where you really bypass the phony guilt and just be fearlessly going into the presence of God and confessing. Or, as it says in the step, in the 12 steps, where we confess to another person what our wrongs have been. Doesn't need to be a priest, but sometimes I think in other spiritual traditions, we've gotten away from confessing to a person that you know loves you and can hear you and can receive you beyond maybe the guilt and fear that you have of confessing itself. It's something we need to work on, I believe, a little bit more in our own spiritual tradition as United Methodists. What's it like to really confess and to experience the love of God forgiving us? Not through a priest who is officially appointed, but any dear friend, any person that's just willing to listen and to smile at us as we are pouring forth our heart and our soul. You've seen me, if you follow the Bible through the season, there's a little note at the bottom of suggesting that you take a look at the reflections of Matthew Henry, the 17th century uh, writer and compiler of commentary for the whole Bible. I went through that and I noticed that there were some lovely things that he's saying and I'd like to just share a few of these paragraphs with you. He writes about how the burden of sin is 
lifted off. By the pardon of it, we may be eased of a burden, a heavy burden, like a load on the back that makes us stoop, or a load on the stomach that makes us sick, or a load on the spirits that makes us sink. Then Matthew Henry writes, God is more ready to pardon sin upon our redemptance, our repentance, than we are to repent in order to the obtaining of pardon. Let me repeat that. God is more ready to pardon sin upon our repentance than we are to repent in order to obtain that pardon. And then a lovely uh, recollection of the father of the prodigal son. The father of the prodigal son saw his returning son when he was yet afar off. You know the story well. And ran to meet him, and this I love, with the kiss that sealed his pardon. When we give the kiss of peace, virtually now, of course, when we give the kiss of peace, it's a seal of love. It's a seal of forgiveness. And Matthew Henry continues, what an encouragement it is that to poor penit this is, to poor penitence, and what an assurance does it give us that if we confess our sins, we shall find God not only faithful and just, but gracious and kind. So the power of God's forgiveness is what makes us righteous. It's by God's grace. We can't claim any righteousness, as Paul talks about, it's filthy rags. We don't have righteousness, but we have it, we have God's righteousness and God's grace when it is brought to us in completion and grace. I'd like to share with you a paragraph from a book that appeared in 1973 by a very renowned psychologist by the name of Carl Menninger. He writes a book, Whatever Became of Sin? And he addresses it in this way. My proposal is for the revival or reassertion of personal responsibility in all human acts, good and bad. Not total responsibility, but not zero either. I believe that all the evil doing in which we become involved to any degree tends to evoke guilt feelings and depression. These may or may not be clearly perceived, but they affect us. They may be reacted to and covered up by all kinds of escapism, rationalization, and reaction or symptom formation. To revive the half-submerged idea of, e of personal responsibility and to seek appropriate measures of reparation might turn the tide of our aggressions and of the moral struggle in which most of the world population is engaged. Think about guilt as we argue with ourselves. We try to excuse it because we're just not willing to accept what's going on. In a Greek tragedy, for example, when the tragedy would take place, the protagonist would say, some God must have blinded me. The incapacity to tolerate taking responsibility for one's actions was so overwhelming that they blamed a God for blinding the person. We don't have to be quite so cautious knowing our faith in the Lord and God's everlasting love for us, we can take the responsibility for our actions. It's a really good way, and I'll be talking about this down the road a little bit more, particularly this Sunday about not being a victim when we explore uh, Joseph's forgiveness of his brothers in the book of Genesis. Uh, what we can do, one of the ways I have found helpful is when you're in a situation and when, because of guilt, we start to blame somebody else. Without blaming anybody, just take this phrase, each of us is 100% responsible for the situation in which we find ourselves. To me, that's a good way of not pushing the guilt thing, 
to take responsibility, to clear a path, just as we began this meditation by clearing a path of the swirling waters, those swirling waters of guilt and blame and finger pointing. Just let them clear out so that the truth of our wrongdoing can be faced in the presence of God and we say, oh God, forgive me. And he does. God forgives. May that grace of God's pardon, which makes us righteous because of that grace, bring you a great peace for the rest of this week and on and on. God bless you.